Okay, well, let's pray, and we will do our best to get started. Well, we begin again this evening to just consider a few texts and practice the care and caution that we ought to have when we are handling your work. We just pray that you would uh, bless the things that we consider uh, this evening, not only with the right understanding of these texts, but also... Um, with learning the uh, potential mishaps that we can uh, face when handling your word. Grant us discernment and faithfulness, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. All right, so this evening's again sort of continuing uh, what we did last week, trying to put into practice some of the things we have learned on how to handle the scripture. Uh, this evening we're going to look at a few texts that are oft twisted. Things that, that uh, are used wrongly. And the problem happens is when something is used wrongly, often enough, it just sounds right. And it just, it just feels right. But I want us to remember, as it says in Matthew 22, 29, at the top of our notes there, Jesus answered them and said, You are wrong, because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. And so the hope to be right depends on knowing the scriptures and the power of God. And often it, it, for, in those circumstances where they were not understanding the resurrection, it, it includes and carries this sense of the power of God to fulfill his word. Even if to them, the Sadducees, resurrection seemed like an absolutely impossible event, these people are dead. Their bodies are rotted, eaten by worms, finished. How in the world is God going to resurrect and, and reconfigure? How is he going to do that? Doesn't make sense. Can't happen. Well, you don't know the power of God. <laughs> you, you don't have the can't happen. When God's word says this is true and this is what he's going to do, then it really is as simple as he can do it because he's God. So whatever he says, he's going to do mm -hmm. because he has the power to do it, even if it's beyond us. All right. And so what a, a, a few verses, uh, there probably, a, there surely are a lot that are often misused, but you've probably heard, um, we'll do a couple Proverbs mishaps. Have you ever heard this? Someone says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Mm -hmm. And false teachers will often say, so if you think yourself a winner, you will be a winner. Mm -hmm. And if you think yourself a loser, then you'll be a loser. Because whatever your self-image is, it will manifest. You ever heard something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot. That's a really popular theme that, that people present. Mm -hmm. And they do it by... Notice I put Proverbs uh, 23, 7a. They do it by not quoting a verse out of context. It's done by quoting a part of a verse. Not even if the whole verse completely out of its context. And so again, you need to, uh, they'll say things like this, you need to learn to love yourself, mm -hmm. respect yourself, and esteem yourself. You need to cultivate in your heart an image of the person you want to be, and it will happen. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some of us have heard teaching and preaching like that. This is basically the power of positive thinking. Mm -hmm. This is not biblical teaching. This is some sort of self-help thing. Some will weirdly go further and tell you to declare it. Speak it into being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is wrong. And you, well, you are not some magical being. There's some typos here in the notes, but uh, nonetheless. Uh, this is a misquote, and, and again, you can go there if you want to. And look with me. In Proverbs 23. And 
we'll, and we'll see this verse in its context, although I think I do have it written in. Yes, I do. Uh, this misquote comes because it's only part of a three-verse proverb. It is likely that if someone reads Proverbs 23, verses six, uh, verses, yeah, six all the way through nine, they will actually pick up on the meaning of the passage. It means this mistake can be avoided by just reading the whole proverb. Believe it or not, the way the Bible works, even the book of Proverbs, isn't each verse equals one proverb. Sometimes... A proverb covers a couple of verses. This proverb covers three verses. And if you were to just read the whole thing, it becomes even clearer. It's even clearer if you do use a more modern translation. It's handled this section a little more faithfully than the King James, because the King James uses the word thinketh, when the word is really um, calculating or reckoning. And the King James uses the word heart, where the word heart's not in that passage, it's nafesh, which is the, the soul or the inner man. Um, but note, the ESV says stingy man, and the New American Standard says selfish man, where the literal Hebrew phrase says evil eye, which the King James renders Accurately, So it says in verse 6, so it says, Do not eat bread with a man of an evil eye. Which is not a phrase we generally use, although we might speak of somebody as having given you the evil eye. And it may have voodoo overtones for us, but that's not the, that's not the, the sense of this. And I've given you in here to help with that, uh, the, the NET Bible its study notes on this phrase is helpful. It shows you this. In the Hebrew, an evil eye, uh, this is the opposite of a good eye, which meant a generous man. Okay, so in their figures of speech and way of speaking, they would refer to someone as having a good eye when he would see someone in need and, and give to help out their need. Someone is having an evil eye, Someone is, is seeing somebody else has good and wants to take it away for themselves. You can kind of follow that flow of thought, right? So that's, that would be a, a Hebrew approach to this. The evil eye refers to a person who is out to get everything for himself. All right. Now, I'm not going to go around and say everybody names somebody like this they know. The New American said these other translations say selfish. He's ill-mannered, ill-hospitable. He's up to no good, even though he may appear to be a good host. So now let me read uh, that phrase that is so misused by some. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Used for having a positive self-image and a help, help, self-help notion. And read it in the ESV, the whole thing, and see if it makes sense to you. Do not eat the bread of a man of an evil eye. Stingy, well, more self-focused man. Do not desire his delicacies. King James there, dainty meats, which is something I'm unfamiliar with, dainty meats. Um, but that would be a phrase in those days that would be a reference to uh, really tasty, desirable things. It, they're, they're coming to you, they're stingy, and yet they're offering you good things. But you know what kind of person this is, and yet they are putting forward such generosity, but that's not who they are, and you know it. And so what he's saying is, yeah, don't, don't take it from him. Because you know, when he puts it out there and you take it from him, does he expect something in return? Yeah. Is he going to call for something later from you? Or is he just being generous? Or is he looking forward to that opportunity? I, you know, I gave him one of my delicious donuts. You know, and never gave me anything back, you know. Just didn't even care. 
I invited him over. He didn't even invite me over back. You know, just this kind of, you know, I was so hospitable, but looking for that opportunity to, to have that, that, that comparison where I get to now talk to somebody else, and in this process, you know what I get to do? Poof, poof, me up. And actually, my, my elevation gets better in their eyes than the other person as I also push them down. Or realistically, I have a hard time coming up in their eyes, so my only hope is to push others down. <laughs> are there people who function like that? Yeah, there are. And it's a sad thing, but Proverbs is noting that there are people like that. And the ESV then goes on in verse 7 and says, For he is like one who is inwardly calculating. He's got a scheme afoot. Eat and drink, he says, but his heart is not with you. He's not doing it out of love, care, or concern for you at all. Then it goes on verse 8 to unpleasantly say, you will vomit up the morsels that you have eaten and waste your pleasant words. In other words, it will come back to haunt you. you know, recognize when, they're, when, when they are uh, uh, being tricky. Otherwise, it'll, it'll come back on you. Now, when you read it in its context, it's clear that this passage is warning about things that are secretly going on in the mind of a selfish individual who may pretend to be hospitable and generous, but there will be unpleasant outcomes from accepting their pretended kindness. That's the simple proverb there. Watch out for pretended kindness kindness from the brazenly self-serving individual because when you receive that kindness, somehow, some way, it's going to end up working against you. What seems to have been done for you is going to end up being detrimental to you. That's what the passage is saying. It doesn't say, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So I'm going to think that, uh, uh, so think yourself successful in business. Think yourself loved by all of your companions and co-workers. Think yourself to be uh, the best husband or the best wife on the planet. Uh, by self-deceiving yourself, does it make it so? It doesn't. What if you can fully convince yourself of that? Do you become that? Yeah. No. Historically, uh, supposedly, uh, insane asylums were filled with people who were convinced they were Napoleon. Or Elvis. Or, or, or whoever it may be. Uh, you know, they, 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 they're convinced they're this other person. Is it true? No, and, that, and that's not what this passage was ever trying to teach. It's not trying to teach self-esteem. It's not trying to teach self-value. It's not trying to teach self-help or, or positive self-image. It's saying, watch out for selfish people because their seeming kindness is a scheming kindness. They've got ulterior motives. And let that also be a warning to us, because some of us may find in the nature of our flesh and struggle against the flesh, at times we may tend towards stinginess or miserliness or self-seeking. We could tend towards that at times, and we want to make sure that when we show love to others, it's not for what we can gain from them. Remember, Jesus scolds those who invite people over and show hospitality just so that they will also be invited over. It says the Gentiles do these things. Give except expecting nothing in return. Invite those over who you know will never have even maybe the means to invite you over because then great is your reward in heaven, right? So uh, that passage in Proverbs 27, an A, is remarkably twisted wrong. Now, what ought, the way it's most frequently twisted wrong is in the midst of a self-help message, they just quote it out. 
They don't even say Proverbs 23, 7. They just quote it out. They'll say, you know, as the good book says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So how do you think about yourself? How do you want others to think about you? And they just go into this world which has completely ignored what the passage is actually saying and teaching. You see how easy it is? Mm -hmm. Because when you first pull it out and you read it only in the King James, it almost seems to say that when you pull that phrase isolated out. But when you correct the language to a better translation and you see it in the flow of the proverb, almost any of us would figure out what it actually meant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now go on with me to a second one, which is also sometimes undesirable for us, but the, you know, is this proverb a promise or a warning? The King James puts it this way. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You ever heard that? Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever known parents who have tried their absolute best before God mm -hmm. to train up their children in the way they should go, explain to them, show them from the scriptures, take them to church, take them to Sunday school, trying to do all the things, <laughs> only to find their kids are secretly growing in their exercise of sin. And that once they reach just a minuscule amount of earthly freedom, they go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometimes a parent looks at the kid and they think, I can't tell the difference between my kid raised with Christian values and these kids raised without it. I, I don't see it presently. And we oft will try to comfort ourselves Someday, eventually, <laughs> they'll come back. Because I trained them up early, the whole middle part's going to be a wash, but at least <laughs> maybe at the very end, they'll come back. And so we try to comfort ourselves. And I don't blame you for that. I completely commiserate with that desire uh, to, to block out the worldly portion in hope of something better. I completely understand that. But is that what this passage is promising? Now I'm going to take you and I'm going to read an older translation this time because some people complain, oh, you, you know, it, yeah, it looks different in the modern translation. Well, sometimes it looks different in the older translations too. And so we go back to the Geneva, which precedes the King James. And it says this, and I, I've, I've left the Geneva spelling, so don't think there's... So, teach a child in the trade of his way, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. Now, I like that when I look out, and as I read that verse, I, I see confusion. <laughs> okay, that, what does that even mean? Uh, teach him what? cross-stitching? What trade are you talking about here? Uh, no. <laughs> Go with me to page two, and I'll explain it a little clearer. Here I give you a literal rendering. This is my own work. Just literally giving the words that are actually in the Hebrew, not adding any words, just the words that are there in the English. Train up a child to go according to the mouth of his way when he becomes old he will not turn away from that <coughs> now that's weird English I acknowledge it but the other translations seem to say nothing about mouth did they no they didn't and actually almost every single English translation that has come since the King James has simply reiterated what the King James says. Train up a child in the way that he should go or in the way that he ought to go. Mm -hmm. The Hebrew does not say anything about the way he should or the way that he ought to go. That 
whole idea should be in italics because it's been added by men. My Hebrew professor, as well as a lot of Hebrew professors actually, tend to view this verse not as a promise, but as a warning. The warning being this. You train up a child according to the mouth of his way. He's mouthing, I don't want to go. I don't want to buckle the seatbelt. I don't want to sit in the car seat. You know, I want this toy. I want this toy. And you train up a child, oh, you want this toy? Here's this toy. You don't want to wear your seatbelt? Oh, don't wear your seatbelt. What? You train up a child that he gets everything he wants. Here's the problem. You know what kind of man he's going to be? The same kind of man who's not used to compromise, who's not used to care, who's, who's, who's not used to consideration, but always only wanting his way or the highway. Not that you've ever heard anybody say that. Or met anybody like that. Uh, so, uh, you know, a paraphrase... If a child becomes accustomed to getting what he wants or demands, then that pattern of selfish desire will become their established way of living. Realistically, simply looking at it from the Hebrew, the warning is more likely than the promise. But listen, just, just as a, a, a simple note, but noting this, whether you interpret it as the King James does as a promise, uh, for those who do, we remember this. Proverbs are, even then, oftentimes, particularly when they speak of the actions of, and experience of men, they're general truths, not guaranteed every single time. Now, maybe when they reference God with whom there's no shadow or shifting, they may be absolute truths that apply every time. But uh, with men, there are often exceptions to it. Sometimes you can correct a few fool and he won't beat you. But more often than not, it's, gonna, it's not going to work out well, correcting fool. I mean, the world is learning some of that right now. Amen. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, so, so, so even if you, either way, um, we all know of a lot of tragic exceptions if you want to consider this a promise. Sadly, it, it, when I think of even my own experience, the church I grew up in, uh, uh, the fellow uh, youth group members coming up through that church, and so on, and, and I was to consider... Where they all are now, yikes. I mean, the percentage who are actually faithful by the grace of God seems pretty small. And so the, it, it, the promise would seem... Now, does, does God, do God's promises fail? No. 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 So if it seems with tremendous regularity, a seeming promise is not actually coming true. Remember, the problem is not ever with the Word of God. The Word of God always proves true. The problem is, is likely we've misunderstood the Word. And strangely enough, and I can't explain it, it seems that those who translated the Hebrew into the Greek years before it was ever translated into Latin and then later into English when it was translated into the Septuagint, this verse apparently was so confusing to them or conflicting to them, it's not in the Septuagint. They just left it out, <laughs> skipped on, and went to the next one. So you get neither the promise or the warning in the Greek version that was given to the Jews who were spread throughout uh, uh, the Greek-speaking, what they called the Hellenistic Jews, of even the days of Christ and the apostles. They wouldn't even have had this verse that so many dear saints have sought to claim to comfort their hearts. But likewise, I will say this. What happens if a parent in their later days 
They are recipients of the mercy and grace of God who saves them. And they look back on their child rearing and recognize, I blew it. I spoiled them. I gave them everything. And now there's no hope for them. Is that right? No. No, because Proverbs are designed with regard to men to have exceptions. And there are exceptions if this passage is a warning, which I'm inclined to see it as. There are exceptions that God can take one who has been fed and permitted to become, uh, he's been spoiled. I mean, the phrase is a spoiled brat. We, we've all heard others referred to in that way. <laughs> you know, and, uh, but the grace of God can actually take such a person and empty them of that and, and open their eyes to that and really completely transform them can take that greedy person and make them a remarkably generous person. The grace of God can do those things, mm -hmm. right? So let so um, we. But I would say, my best understanding of this passage is to take it as a warning. As if you read through Proverbs, you have a lot of those wonderful parental warning passages. Some of them so sweetly say, "Spare the rod." Spoil the child. So, if you're having problems with your children, send them to Ron. <laughs> All right, let's move on to some more confused context words and applications. 2 Corinthians 7.14. It's a big one, even becoming very popular right now. Yes, it is. Because our land is in turmoil. Our nation is in unrest. Everything is all weird, you know, and riotous and chaotic. And there's so much uh, vitriolic rhetoric. Should I simplify that? You get it? There's mean speech. There we go. And it, it says, though, in 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. <laughs> and so what begins to happen? It's even happening in Marshall. Comes in the newspaper. This church or that church is calling for pastors and churches of various denominations to come together so that we will together pray for the healing of our nation. And we need to come together and do that. You know why? Because God's word says in 2 Chronicles, if my people who are called by my... And they're motivated and they come together and, and they pray and, and they're claiming this verse... That they are his people, they are humble, they are crying out, and they're wanting God to heal their land. All good motives. Not necessarily wrong. If they are in Christ, they are his people. Amen. You know, they are in a, in a more extraordinary sense than Israel ever was. They are called by his name. Mm -hmm. But are the promises that we have under the new covenant still promises linked to the land and our nation. Because what we've got to remember is this. Um, this is an Old Testament passage. In this context, as you're asking the question, who is God, through the prophet, speaking to? The answer would be Israel. The nation of Israel. Now, let me keep reading. And God was faithful to this promise by bringing them back from exile to their land and enabling them to rebuild it. What a powerful, faithful, promise-keeping God. Amen? Amen? So we have that promise. We have God attending to that promise and answering it 
powerfully just a few chapters later. Or a few books later, really. But listen to my next sentence here. My people and their land is not America. <laughs> I mean, maybe uh, we, we, we brainwashed ourselves a wee bit by, by saying one nation under God. Uh, it, uh, are we the only nation that's under God? No. I'm pretty sure that all nations are under God. Yes? And, and does our nation really, percentage-wise, follow Christ? The majority of them? I mean, if you look at the news and you look at the media and you look at the, the ideologies and agenda, is this a godly nation? No. no. And again, I can say, that. is any nation a godly nation? No. Was Israel a godly nation? They were marked out to be God's people, but they were not a godly people, which is why they kept coming under judgment. But see, Jesus says, as we remember, when he's engaging Pilate, are you a king? And what does Jesus say? Well, it is as you say, but my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my people would be fighting for me. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. And somehow we read a verse, we turn Israel into America, and America is the new Israel. Americans are the new people of God, and we claim this verse. And it doesn't work. Because it's not a verse that was given to us. Now, what this verse does tell us, though, clearly, is that if God was pleased to restore the nation to peace. If God was pleased to turn the nation back in a godly direction, He is able. Because in this event, we remember, He sovereignly orchestrated their exile through Nebuchadnezzar, and then He astoundingly, sovereignly orchestrated their return from exile through Cyrus. Cyrus, who would rule, that he called by name and mentioned what he would do through Cyrus before Cyrus was even a person in power. Mm -hmm. So we can cry out to God, and I think it's healthy to say, God, bring some peace and stability in this country. Uh, put all this selfishness aside, put all these, uh, these agendas aside, and, and, and help there to be some unity and some compliance. And more than that, help your people to boldly proclaim your gospel yeah. and do a great work of salvation in our days. And I ask, can God do it? Yeah. We have these passages that remind us of God's absolute ability. We also know that God will always fulfill His promises. What His promises are to who He made them. So let's make sure we understand that. But in seeing how He fulfilled that promise, it gives us that sense of His ability. And we plead with Him, Lord, You are able. Nevertheless, we might say in a Gethsemane-like perspective, if it's not your will, mm -hmm. and if this is moving us closer to the end, and things are going to be go from bad to worse, mm -hmm. God, help us not to lose faith. Mm -hmm. Help us not to lose heart. Help us to endure to the end. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us not to shrink back from declaring the truth. Mm -hmm. Help us, Lord. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Have you ever heard... All means all. Mm -hmm. In handling certain passages. Well, let me give you, and we start with the King James, once again. 610. For the love of money 
is the root of all evil. Hmm. Just out of curiosity, did the love of money lead to uh, David's experience with Bathsheba? Was that driven by the love of money? No. Solomon, in his advanced years, turning away from single-minded wholeheartedness to the Lord and building shrines and places of worship for false gods, was it a love of money no. that led to that decision? Or do the scriptures clearly say it was a love of foreign women? Right? So let that be a warning to everyone. The, 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 it's clear. So, the King James says what? All. The love of money is the root of all evil. Yet we know that's not the case. Is the Bible wrong? No. No! no! Were the translators wrong? I uh, am. Yeah. Which is why, if you were to, and we will briefly, read it, jump down, in the New American Standard Bible, it says this, For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Many kinds of evil. Every single evil? Nah. Many, many kinds of evil? Yes. Theft is often driven by the love of money. But on occasion, as it tells us in Proverbs 30, theft could be driven by hunger and a desire to feed your children, right? Uh, the love of money, uh, the scripture even speaks of a time where God was going to bring the children of Israel under such severity of famine and siege that even compassionate women would be cooking their children to eat, which just seems unthinkable, doesn't it? I mean, when I read that, I think that's not even an option. I mean, starving in my mind seems way more an option than potentially doing that. But the scripture speaks of compassionate woman. Would, is that motivated by the love of money? Of course not. So, did the King James get it wrong? Yes, the King James did. Did God get it wrong? No, because the word all in the Greek does not always mean all totally. All does not always mean all. Let me, let me just show you that. So, have you, have you ever heard? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. The Koine Greek word, uh, variants for all, can mean all comprehensively, total, or all kinds, types, or sorts, referring to representatives of various groups. And all can even be used generally or colloquially for many. Sometimes it's not even all. Because the love, the love of money, money isn't all, all kinds of evil, but generally a great deal of kinds of evil. Now, let me show you another verse. Um, and I've already given those questions without reading, but it's there for you to think of even then. Um, consider down also at the bottom. King James says in uh, John 12, 32, and most other translations follow this as well. And I... If, the most modern translations say, when I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So here I have this question for you. When Jesus was lifted up, which is whether you want to reference that to his crucifixion, which it likely is, or you want to go further and be a little bit overly pedantic and speak of it as his ascension, all of those things are part of the climactic purposes of God that bring that transition from the Old to the New Covenant. 
I ask you this. After Jesus is crucified and ascended, are all men drawn to him? Were all the Pharisees drawn to him? Were all those, were those men like Herod that were arresting the apostles drawn to him? All those who were committed to uh, uh, put themselves on a hunger strike until they killed Paul, were they, were they drawn to Christ? And again, to get, to get a strong... Has there, simple question, ever been anyone since the resurrection who was not drawn to Christ? And your answer would be, yes. So, my, so then here comes the challenge. So is the Bible wrong? Yeah. No. Is our understanding of it potentially wrong? Yes. yes. First of all, on, on page three, I want to take you the, the fact that the word draw, is, is, it's, it's not a lighthearted thing. Uh, some people will say, yeah, he draws everyone to himself. He kind of, he gives them, you know, whether they know it or not, they feel a sense of emptiness and need, and, and, they, and they begin to, to make drawing all wishy-washy and wooey. You ever heard that happen? Uh-huh. That's not this word. <laughs> this, is, this is the same word that no one comes to me unless the Father draws it. From John 6. The word draw, when... when, when played out in the scripture, its most literal meaning is to tug, draw, or drag. So, for example, when something, when a sword is drawn, listen, if I've drawn my sword, does that mean it's still in its sheath and I'm, and I'm trying to pull it? No. No. I have drawn it. What happens when I've drawn it? Is that if I if it's not out, have I drawn it? No. See, that's what that's the idea that I think we don't often get in, in modern English, mainly because we don't walk around with swords. You know, we don't have a concealed carry permit for a sword. So it, further, it carries this sense as in Acts twenty one, where you would take someone and forcibly drag them to court. You lay hold of them, you grip them by the arm or grip them by the ear, whatever you, you know, you're imagining, and they end up where you take them. <laughs> the sense of this word draw, it, 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 it moves a person or thing from here to here. It moves them to a different place. Uh, which is why, again, it, it's even the idea of drag. It's used as a legal technical term to force or drag someone into court. Hold on a second. Are you saying that here I am? I don't want to be saved. I don't want to be saved. But God says, I don't care what you want. And I'm running, and he's, he gets hold of my foot, and he's dragging me backwards while I'm crawling the other way, and, and he overpowers me. I end up being forced into the kingdom. Is that what's happening? No! I, the word does carry, potentially, that kind of strength. But... Generally speaking, if I want to be realistic, the sword, is it unwilling to come out? And do I have to force it to come out? No. no. The, the whole emphasis is on the power of the one who wields it. It may even speak of the impotence and inability of the object being drawn and the power being done by the drawer. But it doesn't necessarily demand resistance. Indeed, God draws us by taking us who are by nature at enmity with Him, by nature hostile towards Him, and He makes us willing in the day of His power. He takes somebody like He did to Paul, who says, I do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, and I need to destroy Him and His name. 
and then the next day, what is he? I know that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the risen Savior, and I'm ready to die for the sake of his name. Wait, you were ready to kill everybody for the sake of destroying his name, and now you're ready to die for the sake of proclaiming his name. What happened? Did that change happen unwillingly? No, no, no. He was made willing because God has the power over our hearts, minds, wills, and desires. And when he reveals to us in the gospel the glory of God in the face of Christ, we see the beauty, the excellence, the truth of the gospel, and we desire Christ more than anything else. So that if he were to ask us, do you love me more than these? We would say, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Amen? Amen. So, now, if all means all, when I'm lifted up, the Son of Man will draw all men to himself. If all means all, then everyone would come to Christ. Is that what happens? No. no. But what's interesting is people ignore, and so often do, the context into which a verse is spoken. In this context, Philip, uh, some Greeks come to Philip, Earlier in, 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 the, in this passage, oh, I, I thought I had written it down. Yeah, it's in John chapter 12. And, and they basically say, um, we wish to meet Jesus. And Philip goes, and he tells Jesus, these Jews are here to meet you. And Jesus doesn't end up meeting with them in that passage. They come to meet him, and he doesn't meet him. Then, why? Because when the Son of Man is dropped... Lift it up. Then he will draw all kinds of men to himself. Then the purpose of God moves from the old covenant that was given to Israel to the new covenant of God in Christ that his people are among every tongue, tribe, nation, and people. I give you that example in here. Remember, um, the, the scriptures tell us this. Uh, when Jesus was speaking to the Canaanite woman, though he did still have mercy on her in Matthew 15, um, she asked him for his help and his need. That's an Amber Alert. She asked him for his help and his need, and, and he said this, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what Jesus said, because he was bringing to an end in himself the old covenant. And they were going to have the, the final guilt that would be the breach that brings to an end the old covenant. And so when, when they come to him and say, there's some Greeks here to meet you. Not now. I'm not saying that they can't be saved. I'm not saying they can't come to know me and come to follow me. But not now. Their benefit, when they get to... Uh, they and all of their kinds of people begin to have the opportunity to be, to be my followers and be attached to me. That's when I have finished this work, when I'm lifted up. Which is why, again, Revelation speaks of him in this way. They sing a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So the word all, I will draw all men, is all souls. In many places that I'm not going to show you tonight, the King James itself translates the Greek word all, all manner of. All manner of. All kinds of. So they do it in some places. They don't do it in other places. We need to remember every time we see the word all in English, it might be all totally, or it might be all kinds and classes and groups, or it might be just a general all. Because, for example, um, when after Jesus raised Lazarus, and the report came to the Jewish leaders, they said to themselves, what will we do now for all men have gone after him. D did they all go after him? 
The, those people gathering right there in that room, were they also going after him? No. no. And so theirs wasn't even all in terms of uh, people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. It was, there's just a significant increase in the number of people who are following. So their all was just a general many, a lot. That's the way that language works, right? The whole world knows that. Well, does the whole world know that? Yeah. No, infants don't know that, you know? Uh, a lot of people... So we'll use phrases like all and the whole world generally, which still doesn't apply to everybody specifically. By not knowing that that's how language works and not knowing how scripture works is how so many well-intentioned individuals can't come to a knowledge of the truth because they don't know the scriptures as given and the power of God. All right, next. Uh, material or spiritual promises. And we will end with this one. You've probably heard this before. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened to you. Now, in this verse, talking about asking, seeking, and knocking, does it limit what you can ask and seek for? Does it put parameters on it? So if you want to ask for a brand new Mercedes Benz, or if you want to ask, you know, sports version, or if you want to ask for whatever it may be, you can, right? I mean, you ask, and it will be given. So what you want? You ever heard it presented like that? Mm -hmm. Oh, man, come on. You can do better than that, people. But, the, but it, it gets people excited and whooping because things that they always wanted and thought they would never have this weird deceiver up front is now convincing them God's going to give it to them. They're not going to have to save for it. They're not going to have to work for it. it, it it's just, it's just going to happen. There is a divine welfare system. No. <laughs> that, just, that just doles out and you do nothing. Except ask. And keep on asking. Well, all right. what if ask and keep on asking means, hey, why don't you do it for the next 70 years? Because it also does not give a timetable mm -hmm. as to when you stop knocking and when you stop asking. So, right, yeah, go ahead. Keep on asking. Fine. Maybe, you, maybe you'll be driving your Mercedes on the streets of gold. Okay. You know, what, whatever nonsense you want to convince yourself of. But see, the question is, why do we approach these things with such a material mindset? And I say, I don't want to say this. Because we are material beings. That's part of the problem. The disciples faced this a lot. Jesus would be talking about the false teaching of uh, the Pharisees. And Jesus would say, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Or the leaven of the... Oh, he, oh he's saying that because we didn't bring any bread. Why? He's not talking about bread. He's not talking about literal leaven. You, you guys are so fixed on the material that you're missing it. And the same thing, so that you may know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sin, I say to you, rise up and walk. The most significant thing that happened in that person's life that day was not their physical healing. Because eventually, if they live long enough, they will return to some movement limitations. Right? Right? Mm -hmm. Uh, the significant thing was that he forgave sin. Mm -hmm. And that we see through these miracles that he has the power to forgive sin. Mm -hmm. He has the power to give life. Mm -hmm. He has the power to stop the wind and the water. What manner of man is this? Mm -hmm. We learn the manner of the man. He is God, very God. God's own son. Mm -hmm. And we learn the power of the man. It's wonderful. But, then, but we are so material-minded, we read that, and it says, which of you, because uh, which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone, or asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. Now, I want to note this for you. 
the, the child is asking for bread and fish. Now, I feel like, what's wrong with this child that he's asking for fish? But that's just because that's not my inclination. Some people like that. And generally, for, for many Jews, fish was a, a, a staple in their diet. And in the fishing communities, a relatively cheap and healthy way to eat. So bread and fish was basic. It, when Jesus fed 5,000, what did he do? Fish and loaves. Mm -hmm. you know? Now remember, on, in this verse, the child is not asking for uh, a trip to and stock for Disney World. Right? It, it, the, the child's not asking for uh, half of Legoland in his bedroom. What's the child asking for? Bread and fish. He's not even asking for, for toys. He's not even asking for, like, any of the seeming fun and desirable things for kids. I mean, generally speaking, when you've ever asked a kid or a grandkid, what do you want for Christmas? How many times have they come back with a fish or bread? <laughs> It doesn't happen. And so I think sometimes we, we get so caught up in the ask. And we say, even in this, what is the asker asking for? Necessities. Needs. Not all wants and all likes. And then it says, we do love the fact that God, Jesus says this, if you then who are evil, well, how, how dare Jesus say that? If you then were, how can he know for sure that every single person who's there, every one of them, how can he know they're all evil? Because he's God, for one, and two, because everybody's evil by nature. That's where we all are when we start. And so that's not hard for any of us to figure out and can be right. You then, who are you? Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in Heaven give you good things? What are good things? Well, uh, I will just briefly read for you out of Matthew 26 that I've noted there. I mean, Matthew 6. Listen to verse 25. As, as Jesus is giving a, a sense of... You, you tell me if Jesus is presenting how important the material things are. And tell me if you pick that feeling up from what I read from Jesus' words. And uh, why am I in Mark? Matthew 6, and I begin in verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat and what you will drink. Nor about your body. Does, is Jesus emphasizing you ought to be overly concerned with material things? He actually seems to be saying what? No. Don't you worry about the material things. Don't think about those things. Don't be anxious about those things. And what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. And he goes on and talks about the birds of the air and, and the way that God uh, uh, protects and cares for all those things. And maybe you make your way down to uh, verse 31. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat and what shall we drink and what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. Those who are of the world, not the people of God, they're material-minded. That's to be expected. We shouldn't be like them. Because we should, on the other hand, what? And your Heavenly Father knows you have need of them. So God knows our needs. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Well, is Jesus emphasizing material things or spiritual things as the priority and perspective of his people? Spiritual. Very clear, spiritual things, isn't it? Um, and go on, you can read a few of those other passages for yourself. Just a, a simple reminder, uh, James 4 says, You ask and you do not receive because you ask for your selfish pleasures. Yeah, you have selfish intentions. It's all about you, and you're wondering why God's not giving it to you. Your focus is all wrong. Uh, in, in John chapter 14, where it says, you ask anything of the Father, he says, in my name, and it will be given. 
If you ask anything in my name. Which, if it's going to be in Jesus' name, it has to be according to His character, according to His commitment, according to His values. And what did He value? What did He emphasize? The material or the spiritual? The spiritual. The spiritual such that I'll even go... Um, one of the things that we all forget is, after He says, ask anything in my name, ask anything in my name, and it will be given to you, He then says, verse 15, He says... Um, if any of you love me, you will keep my commandments. A lot of these dear brothers and sisters who want to emphasize, ask anything, ask anything. Uh, they, they don't get to the next verse that says, uh, if you love him, you will keep his commandments. You will live a life of humble, obedient service to God, which is surprisingly full of self-denial. As opposed to, Gimme, gimme, gimme in Jesus' name. Those things don't work. That's, that's, you can't, that's, it's not using His name. It's in His name, which means those things that He taught, those things that He valued. For example, according to His teaching, according to His value. That's why we say, the New Testament will often say, um, and they were baptized in Jesus' name. And so you get this, this sad batch of historic crazies who say, oh, we're not baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, because more often the Bible says we baptize in Jesus' name. So we're going to baptize in Jesus' name only. What's the matter with you? To baptize in Jesus' name means according to His character and instruction. And the way He instructed it was, go into all the world, make disciples, yeah. baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when, some, when a baptism was done in Jesus' name... It was done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which was going to be distinctive to uh, John's baptism to a degree and distinctive to all the other kinds of Jewish washings that took place beforehand. This was new, it was distinctive, and it was clear. Okay, just to get that sense. And then uh, 1 John 5, verse 14 following says, This is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything, Keep reading. According to His will. Aww. <laughs> but see, there's a part of us that... that there, there's, a, there's a part of uh, the flesh that wages war within us. Maybe a part that says, aww. And another part that says, aww. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want it to actually be according to His will because He does know best for me. Mm -hmm. So if He withholds, it's better to withhold. Mm -hmm. If He denies, it's better to be denied. He knows what's best for for, for my short term, my long term, my eternal good, He knows what's best. Yeah. So, um, a lot of people don't like this particular verse because it's got this overwhelming qualifier. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And we know if He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have that request. But see, the phrasing carries this sense. If you ask anything that is not according to His will, He ain't going to hear it. You ain't going to have it. And we say, Amen. If we overcome the material mindedness. Now, to bring it all to culmination, what if, so that we wouldn't misunderstand this passage, what if God, in His kindness, by the working of His Spirit, gave us a, a parallel rendering of this exact communication, but with different phrases. And there it is. <laughs> right there it is in Luke chapter 11. I tell you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. What father among you, and it's, it's more expansive as Luke tends to be, being much more detail-oriented than most because of his background. Uh, uh, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, instead of a fish, will give him a serpent. Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father 
give what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit <laughs> to those who ask Him. So wait a second. In Matthew, it said, give good things. And men thought, let me make a list of what I consider to be good things. In Luke, it tells you, what? Give the Holy Spirit. Because you know for the believer, what are the good things? The power, working, and influence of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We want Him to further help us understand the Word. We want Him to further uh, set us free from temptation that we would live at, in obedience to the commandments. We want Him to give us more gifts so that His body can be built up. We, we want the, the filling and endowing and working of the Spirit of God in us that we might give Him glory and honor and service. Wait a second. So you're trying to tell me good things are not physical things? Look, the dad on the earth gave a fish and gave bread. Yeah. Our Father who is in heaven, yeah, we have food to eat that the world knows not of. Our food is to do the will of the Father that sent the Son. Uh, uh, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so now, as the children of God, the, the things that we find most essential and most ourselves most in need of, the bread and fish of the Christian life, is not material things, mm -hmm. is it? It's the influences and power and sanctification and grace is wrought in us by the working of the Spirit of God. Mm. And so we can continue to do that. God cause your spirit within me to set me free from that temptation, mm. from that weakness, mm. from that failing, mm. from that desire. What? God, by your spirit, help me. And seek and seek and ask and ask. And when you ask according to his will, when you ask according to his word, when you ask those things that are honoring to him and that are essential and priorities in his word, you know what? He will give to all who asks. He will open the door to all who knock. So this absolute promise that all who knock will receive and all who ask the door will be open, is the surety of God's gracious enablement by the Spirit for us to progress of faith by His divine power. Yes. Isn't that better? Mm -hmm. Isn't that better than chicken wings or fish or something else just so fleetingly material? All right, well, let's pray. Lord, again tonight, that we can just spend time in your word and, and just seeing these texts and seeing um, the way they're misused and seeing how uh, passage fits with passage and scripture interprets scripture and context and recipients and, uh, and, and careful translation and, and searching of the original. Help us, Lord, to not twist your text. It's your word. And when rightly understood, oh, what truth, oh, what power, oh, what importance, oh, what feeding it is to the souls of your saints. So, Lord, I pray that you would give us earnest diligence as we seek you. Please grant us ever-increasing influences of your spirit that dwells within us. May we not quench the spirit. May we not grieve the spirit but may we be oft filled with, stimulated, provoked, moved, stirred by mm. your spirit within us, mm. that we would walk in the ways of our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.